Hey everyone, this is Corinne Lafon, your favorite radio host, your only radio host and favorite girl, of course, broadcasting to you from the lovely island of Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean on Between the Lines. And you know how we do it here? We are always grateful or thankful for being here, being alive, being above ground. Not many people are as fortunate as we are to be here and I'm thankful and it's a beautiful day. It's kind of looking like the rain wants to come it's having a conversation with the sun to decide what to do but it looks good it looks good and i have a beautiful guest here with me francesca mandea yes i hope i pronounced that properly she has a wonderful accent i'm sure she would say the same to me we all have our own accent and let me tell you what we're talking about today we're talking about the power of motherhood and believe it or not like i was saying to her off air a while ago that I just finished an episode on black fathers. So here we are doing the reverse, mothers. Let me tell you a bit about Francesca. So Francesca is a Mandea, a powerful voice on paper and on stage, was born in Zimbabwe, but now lives in the Canadian archipelago. Her influence crosses continents and her vitality and her vitally important message is but she has vitality too is creating an international movement of mothers who understand that the lessons they impart to the next generation can change the world she's the author of mother behold thy son straight from the bible and upcoming racial equality welcome francesca to between the lines thank you corinne uh, you kind of faded away, so I, I didn't hear the last thing that you said, um, but thank you for having me. Yes, I'm saying welcome to you. I was reading out your bio. I think there's a bit of a delay in, in when we speak, so that's okay. That's part of the technology. Yes, there is. A delay. And you're too yes. far. That's what happened. You're in Canada. You need to come to Trinidad. That's what happened. That's what you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so Tell me more about it and get me curious and I will come. <laughs> so let me, let me start off by saying one of the things, and I mean, I speak for myself I'm a, as a black woman, one of the play, because we're talking motherhood, Francesca, and as a black woman, one of the, the, the places we yes. go to, one of the places we go to when we think of motherhood as a black woman is Africa, okay? And when we, we see uh, persons of color, black people, and the way how they raise their children, um, their family is important to them. You look at generations, the sort of norms and values and cultures and traditions are passed on. These things mean a lot to me. And I know to a lot of other black women, I can't speak for the other ethnicities or races, how they feel. Or, and I know people look to us for a lot of strength because they see in black a lot of strength and resilience and patience in some respect and a lot of love. And I'm, I'm speaking at that as a black woman and what I see. I think if I were of another race, although I am a mixed race, I'm mixed with Indian and black and a couple of other things in between. But if I were totally just straight another race, I think through my eyes, I would see that of, of the black culture. Now, you are a black woman. And when I read the, the bio, it says you came from Zimbabwe. We are talking motherhood. You're now in Canada. I want you to do a comparison of motherhood in Zimbabwe, African culture, motherhood in Canada. Tell us. <laughs> that's that's not an easy one, but I will speak to my experience and the comparison we will be based on my experience as a mom. So so I became a mom when I was in college. Mm -hmm. So I became a student mom uh, at age 22 and 23. That's not the ideal way of becoming a mom, but I did it anyway. So what that taught me um, as a young woman was to 
set aside everything about me and start focusing on the life that was growing within me. And I felt so much love for the child that I had not met. I, I never knew I could feel that way. As you know, uh, when we are young in college, we have so many influences from people. Friends were telling me, get rid of it. You're still too young or your Catholic is a disgrace. Just get rid of it. No one will know about it. But deep down in me, the mother had already arrived as soon as I felt that little bean uh, in my body, I knew that I was going to be a mom. So I accept, accepted the call. And um, I don't say that with uh, judgment to others who decide otherwise, but I just knew that for myself, mm -hmm. uh, the way I was brought up, I was not going to correct one wrong with another. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a Catholic, I also did not have uh, the guts to be on family planning. So I'm just trying to re reflect uh, in retrospect why I did what I did. So I became a mom again in 1993. Two girls while I was still in college, but I welcomed that gift. I loved my children. I, I started planning my life around my children. So that's the first time I was taught about unconditional love, just loving these little girls and fighting with every fiber in my body to make sure that I save enough to get them to good schools. I save enough to clothe them the way that I wanted to clothe them. And I did their hair and they looked so pretty. So <laughs> it was not a, an easy task because there I am trying to get my degree and there I am already a mom and married under very uh, stressful circumstances. But that was me and my motherhood. And I do not have any regrets at all. My children are beautiful. They are now 20, 28 um, and 27. One is married, so I'm a mother-in-law. And I have a son that I gave birth to five years later. So being a mom in Zimbabwe, my experience was based on the pain that I suffered as a little girl. You see my story, where it begins. I was born girl number three in a succession of girls. In 1970, girls were less important than boys. My mother was expected to give birth to an heir. So when I came, my mother named me Daisy Way. That's a name with a question and had I known. Wow. Had I known that I was going to give birth to a girl. Had I known that the world is going to laugh at me and say this woman cannot produce a son. Wow. And so that's the energy I came to in this world. My mother was fighting patriarchy because she didn't want a girl. So Maybe somebody who's listening has had this experience as an African, and I know that it's not only confined to Africa. This is across cultures. Yeah. So a girl is not an ideal child. And then came my brother. He got a name, the one that brings peace after me. So I've always known that I was born into the energy of you are not enough. And that life was lived through primary school. I took punches for being smarter than some boys in primary school. And in secondary school, a young man felt entitled to my body. And, you know, I'll tell this story about my temper getting so high, not because of desire, but because of fear. He groped me and he touched me uninvited. And by remaining silent, asked myself, am I giving this? men permission to violate me. No, I was a young girl and I was not used to being touched by men that way. So this is my life as a girl child into primary school as a teenager and a woman, a young woman when my parents died, both my parents died, we were told girls focus on your marriages. 
it didn't matter whether the marriage was going well or not, mm -hmm. you don't belong. The inheritance belongs to the boy. Wow. And so it was so painful after losing my parents. In 92, when I gave birth to my girl, I lost my mom. In 93, when I gave birth to my second girl, I lost my dad. In 94, I was told, you don't belong. You are a girl. You don't have anything. And so they're struggling with life and asking myself, but I grew up doing monkey business with my brother. And I never had reason to think that we were not equal because in my home, at least my father told me I was an equal child. And he, didn't only, he did not only tell me, he acted it. When my mother died, my father cut up everything into eight pieces, divided everything equally to each child. But when he died, there was no one to do it for us. So girls, shut up. When I became a mom, as I was experiencing this, the pain that I felt as a girl who's worth nothing, no inheritance, nothing, it taught me that my two girls, they were never going to know that pain that I knew. So my mother wound was aimed by the pain that I suffered. And I knew that I would not subject my girls to this kind of treatment. So as I uh, learned more about life as a young woman struggling through marriage and recognizing after 12 years that I did not deserve to be treated the way I was treated. And so it was time to find myself. I was worth much more than what I was getting in terms of treatment from everybody around me. And I was in a toxic environment. So as I taught myself, I'm worth more. And I want to know what my right is. I want to know how to get out of this situation. I began to stand up and I began to speak up and uh, I got the guts to get out. So as I went through this journey, I had a boy five years later in 1998. And uh, I asked myself, when I'm done raising this boy, what do I want to see? What kind of man is this young man going to be? Is he going to be one of those people who are going to say, I have a girl child, she's less than a boy? Is he going to be one of those primary school boys who beats up girls because they are smarter? Is he going to be one of those boys in secondary school who gropes and touches girls and feels entitled to their bodies without their permission. So I was scared for my son, scared for my son, I was for my daughters. That's when I began to intentionally raise them as equals, to tell them by word of mouth, you are equal. But at the same time, to begin to work with them together to say, help me, my children. I want you to know that you're worth love, unconditional love as a boy or as a girl. In this family, this is how we are going to do it. I want you to help me because I've never done it before. So I sang with my children. We composed a song called Takaye Nzana, We Are Equal. And uh, I really wanted them to own it, especially my girls. And the boy to also know that he was nothing more special than any other child. I gave birth to him the same way I gave birth to the girls. Yeah, and I also didn't want him to feel like he has to pay the sins for all the men just yeah. because he was born a man among three powerful women. So yeah. we wanted to make sure that the boy child also has a voice in the home and he does not hear men are dogs, men are idiots all the pain that we went through because of men. I did not want my son to take responsibility for that. So I began to check myself, what messaging am I sending to this young man? Who will he become? So as I journeyed through motherhood, I was very conscious that I'm not perfect. So I asked them to help me. And so we always had meetings. How are things going? You lead today. Whether you are the youngest and you are the boy or you are the oldest, you are the girl, H1 takes a turn. So that I enjoyed 
uh, parenting my kids because when people looked at us, especially when they were teens, they're like, are you sisters? <laughs> but I just was learning to be a parent, to be a mom yeah. <laughs> all the time. And uh, it was a fun uh, and traumatic experience for me because once the girls hit the teens, they become their own women or they're seeking their own identity. And um, we had a few run-ins there, but I always had my music. I always had that empowerment piece where I taught them their rights, but I also taught them that you are an African child and mother in the African culture. Mother means well. You do not mess with mother because you might lose some blessings. At least that's what I know. I never backchatted my mother. I never spoke ill about my mother. She was not perfect, but she taught me how to love. It's all the lessons that I have about loving and forgiving. I can safely tell you that they were passed on from my mom. And so I was trying to do the same thing. Even when we had challenges, I feel blessed that we had our music and we had our mm -hmm. beliefs uh, in on to help us along the way. I learned to say sorry to my kids. I didn't have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. So I kind of <laughs> didn't have a mother to, to go to. And so, like I said, I was figuring it out along the way, but I think my heart was teaching me how to parent them. And all I wanted was to see them become their best versions. So that's my experience with mothering in Zimbabwe. And uh, when I came to the Arctic now, where I say I came full circle, because I then realized that I now can write about my stories and I'm more relaxed and um, I'm in a different environment, which is kind of permitting. Uh, I came here and learned uh, that women are treated um, as equals in some aspects. They, their contribution in the home is recognized. It's not like it's nothing. It's really like uh, it's worth something. One thing that I know for sure is it's not in every household. Even with people that don't look like us, the women still have the same issues. Yeah. They still are overburdened. They still do more and they still cry for that freedom yeah. to be themselves as mothers, to also have to breathe. Mm -hmm. So I found out that those challenges are not just peculiar to us African mothers. It's a woman's struggle. Yeah. Um, but so this is where I wrote the book, Mother Behold Thy Son. And I said, it's a gift to my son, who's now 22. You will turn 23 in 2021. And um, one thing that I share in my book, my experience with my son, is the blessing of able to have conversations, that vulnerability, that ability to to listen to him and to even go for an HIV test upon his initiation. That's the level of uh, detail we get to with my son. For him to be free to express his emotions and not fear that people are not going to uh, ridicule him. So uh, that's my experience with my son. And so in 2019, I published Mother Behold Thy Son as a gift to my son and telling him what I wish for him, that I want him to be a responsible son, a brother, citizen, husband, co-worker, all that he can become. And the thing that makes that possible is if he can love and love unconditionally as I taught him or as I tried yeah. and I'm still trying to teach him. So, yeah, um, that's my experience from Zimbabwe to the Arctic. <laughs> I am still mothering them, but in a very different way because they are all adults. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But I don't think motherhood is a job where you can have a break. No. I think you have a break when you take your last breath. That's right. Because believe me, the children still come. Mom, mom, can I have this? Mom, I need help with this. And I'll always be there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's in the mom's mind. I don't know if I have answered you. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's in the mom's manual, darling. That's in the mom's manual. And it's not even the fine print. It's the only print. You are a mom forever until you die. <laughs> it's in the only print. And, yes. and uh, that's the only line yeah. in the book. <laughs> yes, yes. I love your story. I love yes, your story, yes. Francesca. And, um, you know, <laughs> as you said, it is cross-cultural. It has nothing to do with color. It has nothing to do with where you live. It has nothing to do with who you were born to. It happens throughout. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. and what I love about what you're saying is how you became a better mm -hmm. mother than your own mother. You, you learn so much from her. You thank her for what she taught you. And you recalibrated that into the person that you wanted to be and you want your children to be. So I want one of the messages coming out of this interview to be anyone having a child and feel that they don't know what they're doing. It's okay. You will figure it out because there is no school that you can go to. It's the school of life. As some people say, the school of hard knocks, you learn as you go along. And as Francesca said, you never stop being a mom, no matter how old you get, because we two are children of moms. So we go to our moms, and so our children will come to us. It never ends. And so you don't know the answers. We are expected to know the answers, but you don't know all the answers, but you seek it. You said you're Catholic. I am also Catholic, so I can resonate with that. And you go to a higher source. It doesn't mean that you have to be Catholic. Any religion, whatever you belong to, you go to your, the higher source. Hopefully it's God, the one and only, to be able to get the answers that you seek. Or somebody who, who you may recognize, whether it is a pastor, a counselor, somebody, a good friend who have done it well and you observe and you feel you could go to this person for help. So, you know, you have done it. And I think you have done a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. And I want to also say to you, like I mentioned earlier, I had a guest on just a few minutes before you, and we were speaking about what can we do? Because I was saying the women are the ones who bear these children, and we are the ones who are taking on most of the responsibility in the household. The men are really disappearing. They're not living up to being the kings in the home. And what you said there a while ago about being vulnerable is exactly what we were saying in the show before. We want men who are vulnerable, not necessarily weak, but being able to communicate, show their true selves, be open to us as women, because sh showing that is exposing a level of trust, building a level of trust. With the you know in the couple in the family that allows the bond mm -hmm. as much as men have been brought up to think that if you cry you're weak as a matter of fact it's the opposite once you cry it shows your strength to me i want to be able to see a man cry i want to be able to see a woman cry it shows me you're human you are real you have blood running through your veins you have empathy you understand you can relate you know, so when you don't show that to me, it tells me something is wrong. Something is wrong. So when when it is perpetuated by mm. fathers, when mm. it is perpetuated by fathers to their sons, don't cry. Get up. Dust off your thing. You're a man. You're a man. No, we need to let go of that teaching. Let go of that sort of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, upbringing that we were programmed. It is not the right thing to do. And I am so happy to hear you bring in this other side mm -hmm. of the coin that you sit with your children and one by one around the table or wherever you're sitting down together as a unit that you, you hear each other's voice. You allow everybody to have a voice. You hear and respect it. And this is what we need to have, not only in the family, in our homes, but all over. If every home does it, the world would be a better place. 
So we are talking about the power of motherhood because we know the power yes, of yes. mothers. We know the power of mothers, Francesca. We are the tower of strength in the home and in society. Men know it. They might not want to admit it, but men yes. know it. Men know it. The world knows it. And we know it. And once we recognize the value that we bring and we yes. recognize the value in ourselves, because you said it, you deserve better. You deserve more. And the only reason you can say that to yourself is because you know within you, you, you are valuable. You're not as, as, as how your parents, your mother put you down. You didn't have anything. You're nobody. No, that is not the case. God did not create anything that is not invaluable. Everything mm -hmm. God has created is valuable and has a place. Yes? I want to be able to feature your website, Francesca, as we're rounding yes. up here. Remind me of your website again. Okay, so, so far, uh, it's just a book website. So you find it uh, on Amazon. It's Mother Behold Thy Son. I have an upcoming website in my name, www.francescamandea.com. It's not yet live. So the only website that you could uh, access is my book website, which is um, my Amazon author profile. All right, um, let me see if I can bring up that. Under book. Mother Behold Thy Son, which is my oh, book. Hold yes. on one second. Hold on one second, uh, Francesca. Let me see if I can, um, I can bring that up here. I'm trying to bring up the, where do I have the Amazon website here? So we're on Amazon. Did I send that to you? I can't remember. And to go and look for that now, I'm not so sure. Is it on Amazon you said? Or you, you want to give me the link? Okay, yeah, so yeah, it is on Amazon. I'm, I'm looking for it right now. If I get it, I will, uh, okay. Amazon. Oh, I spelled behold wrong. Okay, so I'm going to put it in chat. Mm -hmm. So this is your, this is um, your book here, and I see it here beautifully done. It's on Kindle and on paperback, so you have it in both formats. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So there is. I put. I put my my the website in in chat. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. That's the one. Yes. All right. Let me just see if I can um if it will come up here as well. I think it will be the same thing though. Okay. So your your Amazon author page. Yes. So this is it here for you. Beautiful. And of course, you're showing yeah, yeah, yeah. you're Sorry. showing off all the designs. Yes. Do you have to do that? You're showing off all the designs. Oh my God. <laughs> it is so beautiful. Oh yes, yes. That's all the brand. It's bold the... and loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And beautiful. And the head wraps and everything. Oh my God. Mm. So persons, I I thank you. Yeah, check out the book, Mother Behold I Son. It's in both formats, uh, Kindle and paperback. Yeah. Well, this has been such a wonderful discussion. Yes, yes. Here. Francesca, you're a wonderful, powerful mother and powerful woman. And I thank you as a black woman, not only to represent the black race, but to represent all races that it is possible, that we have the power in our hands to change the world. Yes to change the world. We are the ones who are the fruit bearers with a queen. We are queens and I'm not saying queens as black queens and women. We together with a man can create powerful things. And a man who has that sense will recognize that when he has a strong woman, black, white or any other next to him, what can be done? It is not for them to be intimidated, but for them to recognize the value that they have, as opposed to being intimidated, which we don't need. Yes, we don't, yes. We don't need that. We need a king. A queen needs a king. Okay? And that is what makes the union stronger and the yes. unit stronger. 
So I thank you for being a queen in your home, a queen of the race, a queen for the world. Thank you so much, the power of motherhood. Any final words before you go, Francesca? Uh, yes, to every mother who's listening, just know that you are anointed. You are your child's first teacher. It begins in the womb and it's undisputable. We have power of unconditional love. Imagine if every mother start teaching their children truth and teaching them unconditional love, teaching that each and every child that's born of a mother is equal and deserves equal treatment. We could change the world. And so if you're a mom and you're listening, just know you have the power, the power to lead, the power to influence the world to be a better place. Well said. Thank you again, Francesca Mandela, for being on Between the Lines. Thank you, Corinne.